Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. Um, my name is Amanda Merck, and I'm here with John Hernandez. And um, we're going to be discussing the five steps to start a trauma-informed care system in your school district. Um, so just a couple housekeeping rules. Um, if, there, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to type them in as we go, and we will definitely leave time at the end um, to go over them. And feel free also, if there's any technical issues, to add a comment in the comment box. So my name is Amanda Merck again. I'm with Salud America. We are based at the Institute for Health Promotion Research at UC Health in San Antonio. And our special guest, John Hernandez, is the Director of Student Services at East Central Independent School District um, here in San Antonio. And Salute America, we're um, a nationwide organization that focuses on sharing the latest research and resources um, that are culturally relevant to inspire people to start and support healthy change. Uh, we're looking at healthy changes in policies and schools and systems to help Latino children and all children um, live, learn, work, and play in a healthy and safe environment. Um, director, our director here is Dr. Amelie Ramirez, and we are funded through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So our agenda today, we're going to go over some of the science behind adverse childhood experiences, and then I'll pass it over to John to share what they're doing in their school district. And then we'll go over this toolkit that we have created to help other schools start something similar. And then we'll save time definitely for um, questions and answers. So real quick, kind of before we start, we sort of use some of these terms interchangeably, um, adversity, childhood trauma, toxic stress. Um, these are all traumatic events that can have negative lasting effects on health and well-being. Um, examples of these are physical and sexual and emotional abuse, uh, neglect, domestic violence, um, witnessing any kind of violence, food insecurity, chronic poverty, uh, racism, and bullying. So a, a lot of these issues during childhood impact early childhood development, um, changes brain, changes bodies, changes behavior. So we'll kind of use these terms interchangeably. Um, I, I tend to use trauma more often. So this is, this is what we're referring to when talking about childhood trauma. Um, and a lot of kids are facing childhood trauma and, and it's starting really early. So for example, for the number of youth requiring hospital treatment for physical assault related injuries alone. So one very small subset of all the types of trauma we're talking about, um, just these children would fill every seat in nine stadiums. So it's happening often and, and it's happening young. Um, a national study of Latino adults asking them to look back to their childhood and over three fourths experienced at least one eighth. Um, and the same study found that over a quarter experienced four or more aces. So it, it's happening often and it's happening young. And when it's happening young, the problems are that it's impacting childhood development um, physiologically in their brain. So these repeated and chronic activation of stress hormones bypasses the thinking part in the brain and activates the survival part of the brain. So if you think of the kind of fight, flight, or freeze scenario of survival, is these kids are chronically in that state and that impairs their brain development and activity. It strengthens these neural pathways and they become more efficient and predominant which interrupts development and impairs complex thought and learning. So it, it impairs um, more higher functioning um, and cognitive ability. It also changes the child's behavior. Um, children facing childhood trauma and toxic stress um, tend to display more aggression. They're more irritable, whiny, clingy, moody. They also tend to have more physical ailments. They claim to have more headaches and stomach aches, and they overreact to um, nicks and bumps. Um, and then they also underreact to certain situations too. They have difficulty with kind of some emotional, um, social and emotional issues, communicating feelings, um, managing conflict. 
and they're easily startled, so kind of both hands, they overreact and they underreact, um, this association of authority, distrust of others. And this can cause long-term problems. Um, the brain and through the behavior causes long-term problems. These kids miss more school, they have more attention problems, and then they face more um, referrals and more disciplinary actions like suspension or expulsion and other disciplinary actions due to uh, misconduct. Um, they tend to engage in higher rates of smoking, substance abuse, teen pregnancy. They're more likely to drop out of high school, have uh, failed, adult, failed relationships all through adulthood. Um, these kids tend to be a part of or victims or um, offenders of domestic violence involved in the juvenile and criminal justice system. Um, and then they face many health risks as well. They're at higher risk of anxiety, depression, cardiovascular disease, um, autoimmune diseases, viral infections, and just a, a whole host of other issues affecting them mentally and physically. So we love this quote from Dr. Joe Hendershot. Um, Many of these children, they're not at risk anymore, and speaking at risk of, uh, they at risk of dropping out. So many of these children, they're not at risk anymore, they are wounded. Their deep scars of emotional, physical, and mental pain are stuffed deep inside because of the, as a society, we are led to believe that they will go away. Um, and the science is showing is it's not going away. These children are not growing out of it, so to say. Um, they're facing long-term, lasting, negative impacts. So the good news is, although children are, yes, children are definitely resilient, um, they're only as resilient as the adults around them who help to build their resiliency. Um, and with this, as relationships are definitely a buffer and relationships help to build this resiliency um, for adults um, to provide st stable, consistent, predictable relationships. Um, it helps for adults to recognize trauma-related behaviors in children, um, and then recognizing their reaction to the behavior so it doesn't further traumatize the child or isolate the child. It's important to help kids feel safe first, um, and then teach kids skills for self-regulation or other academic skills. Um, and kind of expanding on this idea of, of resiliency in relationships is extending empathy, mercy, and grace. Um, looking to alternative disciplinary actions um, like community service. This is within the school, also kind of within law enforcement. Um, giving these wounded students different avenues to express themselves, building self esteem and connecting them to community, um, and kind of building on social and emotional intelligence. And then, as well as for those educators and caregivers, is um, self care um, to prevent compassion fatigue. So all these are kind of ways to address childhood trauma. It's in the adults, it's in the uh, relationships to build resiliency. And kind of the first step in that is for adults to change the shift in this mindset. Instead of asking what's wrong with you, we should be asking what happened to you. Um, and so there's kind of two schools of thought. When, when looking at what's wrong with you, it kind of leads to the school of thinking towards therapy and counseling, um, but this can take months, this can take years, this costs a lot of money, compared to the mentality of what happened to you. And this is changing, um, this is changing the culture, this is changing the culture in schools and communities to extend mercy and grace um, to, for alternative discipline and kind of opening the door for more connection and more relationships within the school instead of you know, maybe sending a child just to one hour therapy a week, instead creating this whole school culture uh, of safety and trauma sensitivity. And East Central ISD here in San Antonio um, is doing this. They're taking this what happens to you approach instead of the what's wrong with you approach. Um, and so I'm gonna pass it over to John right now. We did a case study on everything that they've been working on out there. And that is the basis, kind of the foundation of this toolkit along with a lot of other research and evidence-based um, programs and trainings. So if you wanna write these short links, these bit links down, the salute to forward slash EC cares, and then the video, if you wanna write those down, those will take you to the case study. 
And then we did um, our Slow Hero video on this as well. Um, so if you want to take a quick photo of this slide or write those down real quick. Um, and I'll pass it over to John Hernandez to kind of go over what, um, what he's doing in his school district. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm John Hernandez. I'm the Director of Student Services at East Central ISD. Uh, here in front of us is that PowerPoint, just kind of gives our demographics of as to where, uh, how big East Central and what part of the San Antonio we're located. We're in the southeast uh, side of San Antonio, 10,300 students. We're 70% that come in disadvantage. One high school, two middle schools, one, uh, two intermediate, six pre-K through three. Uh, when we started this in 2015, uh, based on our attendance was our, our main focus on how we came about uh, recognizing and listening to the story uh, that students had something else that was out of their control. Uh, we had 1,041 students that had three or more unexcused absences. Uh, students, it reduced down to six, 656 that had 10 or more unexcused absences. That's when we discovered uh, in meeting with each of the families uh, that it's definitely something that we had to be proactive on. It was something out of their control. We didn't feel comfortable sending them to court. Um, and so in listening to, we basically took an approach of listen to understand before response. Um, that was a big piece that we did with all our, uh, our, our team and our focus group. So in, at that same time in October, uh, I was very fortunate to attend the Dropout Prevention Conference here in San Antonio. Uh, Dr. Hendershot was a speaker. Uh, Ms. Jenny Becker had gone to the pre-conference and said, you need to go hear Dr. Hendershot. Um, he's got, some really good things to say. And, and me being naive, I've been working with at-risk students for years, uh, felt that at-risk was at-risk. And, and so it didn't take but 10 minutes in that conference in, in his introduction to understand that there's students beyond that risk uh, that were not getting their needs uh, met. And so the, the list of students that I had at that time, and this is October, that had uh, over 10 absences at that time, it was about 34. And, and as Dr. Hendershot said his stories, I was able to connect student names to those stories because I knew that this is what's going on as far as what's impacting us directly in, in our community. Um, and he did, Dr. Did, Hendershot did say, if, if you want to see how real this is, why don't you poll your students? I'm over, also over the DAP student uh, alternative school. And so I polled each one individually um, as I monitored the bus before school and after school. Um, and sure enough, 88% had a traumatic event. And in the spring, 93% had. So it's pretty obvious that it, it definitely was, they had something that, but again, the shift from um, what's happening, what's going on versus why, why are you not coming to school? Um, you know, why are you acting that way? Those are the, the previous questions that I was asking. And, and so luckily I was able to get some insight to, to reframe the way I, I directly impacted and had conversation with students. And out of the 70 students, 35 students, had never talked to their counselor or anyone at school about their circumstance. So I give one example of a, a student that came to us from a different district and his father passed away when he was in fifth grade, but never had he spoken to anyone. And then uh, he also didn't have a father figure to kind of help mentor him during those process. So there's just some things that we looked at internally as to how we can address those matters. So the big thing that we noticed, and, and most states across the country have some form of at-risk indicators that say, well, these, if you, don't, if you don't meet these needs here, or if they have these indicators that the predictor that they may be a dropout, they may not graduate. Uh, whether they're in pre-K, kinder, first, second, or third, uh, those are indicators that follow them throughout the system. So we're with Texas Education Agency, they have the 13 at-risk indicators. The biggest ones that uh, if they fail two or more, uh, classes in, in one grading period, if they failed any form of a uh, star test, uh, achievement test, uh, teen parent, if, if the student was incarcerated. Um, and so it's more academic driven to the left on the right side um, was more of beyond that risk. So basically Dr. Henderson refers to as a wounded students. We, we transformed uh, our committee. We came up with the name EC Cares. Um, pretty obvious that I was dealing with a student in elementary school. Uh, his situation was unique on the absences because of the fact that uh, it, attendance is not one that's an indicator for the at-risk 13, and but both parents were incarcerated for this young man. And so 
the student wasn't wasn't incarcerated, but so the parents were, and so the automatically was affecting him social emotional. So on the on the right side, it's more social emotional learning, uh, counseling address given supports to the family, um, and so basically we took the approach of what resource will we connect the family with. Uh, where previously it was, I'm sorry that you're going through that. I'm sorry your father passed away, but you still need to come to school, those things. So uh, that's something that we took, uh, being proactive. Definitely introduced the idea to our superintendent to, to get approval. Uh, was fortunate, went to the, reached the Wounded Student Conference in, in, uh, in June in Florida. Upon my arrival, I, I had all these signs, basically, uh, different reasons as to why students weren't coming to school. Um, took it to Mr. Toscano, and uh, he definitely gave the thumbs up and, and said, all right, so what's your plan of action? And I said, well, I'm, you know, we're going to create a, a focus group. And so definitely involved a, a representative from each campus. I, I met with each principal and asked for their, give me someone that you feel that can help us. Again, we're trying to improve the attendance on your campus. Uh, and so each, each principal uh, gave, gave some names. And at the same time, knowing that we need to have some major stakeholders in here beyond just uh, a representative from the campus. So we reached out to our social worker, uh, nutrition uh, director, uh, special ed staff, uh, transportation, uh, athletic director, uh, custodial staff. It just went on and on. So we, we created uh, uh, the entire district to have a voice in that. Um, and so we that was a building the vision and, and the action plan. So. We created a, a chain of command um, from the point is if the teacher or if the counselor got that information, we need to get that to the right person to to respond. Uh, and at times, each since each campus had a representative, that person was able to handle that indirectly uh, on their campus. Indirectly, I apologize, on their campus. And then they would contact our social services or myself uh, to, to ensure that what can we we can do to assist the family. So the campus responsibility was basically on the student uh, from our end, student services and social services, we focused on the families, and then we worked together on getting them the resources that were needed. Uh, chain of command, we, and we created a resource guide uh, that has, that's up to date, it's got the, the date at the very bottom. That, that resource guide is constantly being updated uh, with, with current contacts uh, due to nonprofit agencies if, if their grant ends today at midnight, well, their phone number becomes disconnected tonight at midnight. So we, we really quickly identified that we need to, to check this uh, resource guide uh, periodically throughout the year. And at the same time, I, I called each one of those numbers uh, to verify that they were in existence. Uh, unfortunately, as I went through this, I guess this uh, focus on, on my end trying to create this resource guide, there were some numbers that were disconnected and there were some uh, that will put me on hold for longer than two hours. So it's uh, it's pretty clear that you need to the resource guide that you create that make sure that it's maintained, it's sustained by calling throughout the process uh, because it's got to be ongoing. Because if you're giving this number out to the community, you definitely want to be able to validate uh, that information. And so to this day, we still call check randomly uh, to make sure that those numbers are accurate and, and, and active. And if we give this to any student or family uh, employee in our organization. We definitely want the feedback. Uh, if there is any negative interaction, we want to follow up with uh, and, and get to the root cause as to what what what, what occurred on that interaction. Um, and our tracking system that we use, we use our Region 20. Uh, so not only was it crucial to identify these students, but then it was a matter of putting them on Region 20 to where everybody in the system had an idea. Currently, we were using our, our red alert system. Uh, if you click, click in the student's name, it gives you the red alert, and the red alert just tells you basically be aware of if the parent can't be within 300 feet of the school. And so we tailored that information with EC Cares. So it became EC Cares uh, dash with, with the campus and then the date. And the date's really an important piece because that's an anniversary of some type uh, of, of the traumatic experience that they're, they're, uh, that they're going through. But you also want to put the proactive measures in place prior to that event. And then professional development, uh, we'll, we consistently, continuously uh, attend uh, other trainings, especially now on, on trauma or any of the social emotional learning. Uh, Dr. Henderson's got online uh, classes that, that some of us in our district have uh, attended. And the piece was our, our first group that, that 
this is a kid system, right? So meeting the needs of our students. But then as I went out to the bus drivers, this first group that I approached first and the last to have the interaction with the student to where you see something, say something. Uh, it was important to communicate that they had a voice in this system, that they had a voice in, in uh, it, was, it mattered, they were important. Uh, and so with that being said, it increased the awareness, but at the same time, there were several in that room that, that sought out their own uh, counseling due to the traumatic event that they were going through in their system. So it, immediately it became, it was a student system, then it became a uh, staff wellness in our entire district uh, because we had several people in our, in our district that were utilizing those services. So the community resource guide, uh, definitely updated on the back, which really was the signs that I took to Mr. Toscano. Uh, I actually took it to him on a napkin, uh, fresh off the airplane uh, in June of that, that summer. And it just had abuse, anger, violence, you know, absence of a parent, lack of support. It was basically, it's broken down into four categories, physical, emotional, disorder, and social. And so these were reasons that students and families gave to me as I, myself and a municipal case manager from the courts, met with each family um, and that kind of put the stop sign on. We're not going to proceed further because we got to get the family the resources. There's no need to send a student to court uh, on a hospital situation, for example. It's just going to compound the situation. We need the student to, to not only be in school, but at the same time communicate. We're here together. We're, you're going to graduate. But at the same time, you know, feel free to take care of your needs, uh, you, you know, your mother's in, in, in hospice. And, and, but at the same time, because school became secondary to this child. It wasn't primary. And so we wanted to make sure that we aligned, uh, we were communicating that we, we were there to support him and that school is important, the graduation piece, but at the same time, you gotta take care of your social emotional needs at that time. And the young man did graduate. Um, so he at least, you wanna communicate that you're there for, for these students. Um, we also have you know, domestic violence abuse, alcohol abuse, counseling, food, emerging homeless service, other, so many things that have, have come across our, our, our desk and our, and our organization that we feel that the more we can put on this resource guide, it gives more of an opportunity. Um, and everyone that I called, again, I, I posed as a student, uh, a minor, I had a whip in my hand, I was ready to hurt myself, I didn't have insurance. And these that are on this list are validated. They're like, come on in, you don't need to have insurance, we'll, we'll discuss that later, but why don't we just need to get you some care? And those are something that we communicate to all the families that when they seek out support, uh, that they've been uh, validated. So the chain of command in our district is that the initial responder uh, reports to the appropriate staff on their campus at the district supervisor. So for example, if a cafeteria manager at one of the elementary schools sees the information, she knows that they, she's got two things to do. Number one, uh, two choices. She can either go to the representative of our council or our focus group, uh, EC CARES committee, they're on that campus. Or number two, she can, he or she can go to our, the director of nutrition and report that uh, to the director who then in turn get with me, myself, or Ms. Raquel Hernandez, our social worker. And then, so we'll follow up with that campus to ensure that that student gets the, the, the counseling needs that, that he needs and deserves. And again, we wanna get, make sure that the counselor visit with the, fam, the, the student and then on our end, in our student services, we're gonna visit with the family. So it's a two for one, trying to knock two birds out basically at the same time, because at times, the mother or the father doesn't know what to do with the, with the child because they're struggling uh, emotionally. And our goal is to get the family as to what they need. And there's a lot of group counseling now based on some of these services that we've addressed here on, on the resource guide. So the red alert box mentioned earlier, so it's real simple. Uh, very, again, you don't wanna breach confidentiality. So we took the uh, McKinney-Vento approach, the EC Cares is a program, uh, Harmony is a school, uh, elementary, and then you put the date, uh, and currently in our system, it's, it's used for stay away form, disciplinary contracts, host forms. And again, if a parent can't be within 300 feet. So anyone in the organization uh, that uh, looks up at a student's demographics and it has a red alert box and it allows you, you, you click on that red alert because it'll give you brief information uh, on that. So it's a need to know basis. Uh, using my daughter here as a sample, uh, we're using region, region 20, uh, the iTech system. So there's my daughter, but the special alert, I would, Anyone in that system will click on that special alert box to tell me, well, what's about, what is, what do I need to know about Destiny Hernandez? And so when you get into the description box, you'll see EC Cares, Oak Crest, and the date. So it's there, again, the date event occurred, proactive anniversary, 
Uh, each campus can print their entire special alerts throughout the year or at the end of the year. Uh, each campus can inform every appropriate staff member between campuses. I know a uh, campus, they meet with their whole administrator team on the list uh, and can provide deliberate scheduling and programming. So at the end of the year, when you print this list, if you already know that three or four of those students going from fifth grade going to sixth grade, if they're lacking a father figure, you can put them in sixth grade with a math person or, or whatever male role model uh, to deliberately uh, would schedule that into their schedule. And so basically you're doing adult mentoring, uh, we call it ghost mentoring, uh, without the student knowing. And so we're keeping a lot more eyes on that student. The professional development, we're continu continuously seek and grow. That's the other thing, we, we, don't, we don't stay stagnant. Uh, Drop Hopper Prevention Conference uh, hosts some, some, some uh, great speakers. The Hope for the Wounded Student Conference, uh, I'm actually, uh, we'll be speaking at that. Uh, here next month, and that's something that I've been going to this is my third year, but Dr. Hendershot does a great job uh, in getting some lined up some phenomenal speakers. Uh, Pathways for Hope Conference, uh, Bear Cares, uh, Melissa uh, Tejerina does a great job. We partnered up with their, uh, their Bear Cares, but here, that's internally here in San Antonio to where you reach out to your local community as to what other resources, because it takes a village to get a child to, to graduation, and so it definitely uh, takes a lot of people, but the more you can get informed, we, we've been able to send more of our staff to hear Dr. Hendershot at free of cost at times due to Melissa Tejerina. South Texas Trauma Informed Conference was here last uh, last couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had Dr. Uh, Bruce Perry and Dr. Hendershot, both experts in the field, but you can never know enough. You don't want to just keep learning and to share with your team. Um, and at the same, like I always communicate, trauma doesn't stop at four o'clock. So what can we do to assist that child to be able to be resilient, uh, have the grit to persevere doing, not only acknowledging, but you listen and understand the story, but let's let's get you the resource and let advocate for yourself as to what you might need at all times, hours of the night. So it grows to the EC Cares District Awareness. Uh, definitely been able to present to many, multiple departments and campuses. Uh, you know, the science behind the trauma is pretty, it, it affects most, it's pretty blatant. Uh, Dr. Perry and both Dr. Hendershot talked about, you know, uh, Manny shared that slide earlier. When you're not getting the, the connectors in your brain, uh, it, it definitely affects learning. If it's not a safe environment, it's going to affect the learning. Uh, Dr. Perry basically said that the most important uh, lifespan for a child from zero to two years old. Uh, and at that time, if there's any form of abuse, uh, it's going to affect the learning later on. So it's, it's, Basically, my lens now has grown now to, you know, there's some things that are probably occurring in some kids in elementary, middle school that, that we definitely got to get to the root cause, right? Listen to understand before you respond. But there's some things that are out of our control that we have to do a, a, a great job of listening to put all the resources in place. Because, again, we want the student to graduate, but at the same time, have the empathy to, uh, you know, walk in the shoes with them. Like, I'm sorry you're going through this, but we're going to get you to, to where you need to get to. Um, and we use our attendance data. That was basically how this was born and brought to life was, was through this, uh, through attendance that we just kind of, instead of just pushing these students to core, we basically stopped and what else can we do for you? But the question became not, why are you not coming to school, but what's the barrier preventing you from coming to school? So this basically EC cares to become an, uh, we're, we're eliminating barriers and we're listening more to the story. Uh, and at the same time, connecting them for whatever resource is necessary. Uh, again, we always, the resource got added two more. I added some grandparents raising grandchildren last week, and I put the date significantly because that's the most updated copy. Uh, you don't want someone in your organization having a, a copy that's a year old where we've already done two or three different uh, updates throughout the year. And you always communicate the chain of command. Uh, every time we have an EC Cares meeting, we meet every six weeks. We, we go through that, use the WST, 1250 to, to, to get, get on Region 20 and then put that information because your system is only going to be as good what you put, what you put into it. So it's the identifying piece has been critical, but the follow through is to put them on, on Region 20 so that everybody in the system can, can get that. Other actions is uh, the state's new approach to is technically uh, alternative discipline. So we've done a first offender program uh, with students that you know, any misdemeanors where before they were given a, a citation, well, we, we put them community service, we work with our police department. Uh, so that's been a restorative approach that we've done and we've taken, it, taken that approach and kind of just 
continue to, to build instead of creating something new it was more aligning what we're doing to, to something that was already there so uh, the first offender program allows for counseling or community service for a ticket or an arrest it's kind of like a floating ticket kind of what we in our terms of administrators we use and then we connect into agencies for mental and behavioral services um, and then we have a, there's a, a ways that we're trying to to schedule for the future is you look at the weekly advisory period um, I know other districts uh, they do use seven mindsets for example they do it every two weeks uh, on during an advisory period so those are some things that we're looking at how can we further uh, put social and emotional opportunities you, you know you got to position student Dr. Henderson big on you got to position students to experience empathy uh, to get the feelings the emotions of, of how other students are feeling that's a key piece um, as to moving forward with this work uh, continue to meet moving forward is we're going to continue to meet with our EC CARES committee we already have all our dates for 2018-19 um, I've inherited counselors so next year it'll be once a month we'll meet with EC CARES committee and so it'll all the counselors now will be part of the EC CARES committee Currently, we have about 70%. Uh, and again, each principal chose who they felt at the time, but now that I'm over counselors, all the counselors will be in the room along with the committee, uh, and we'll continue to meet. Uh, we'll continue to seek information on emotional literacy and compassion fatigue, uh, because we do know that uh, in education, teachers are leaving and burning out at a fast rate, so we constantly got to equip our teachers on how to take a deep breath, basically, uh, and get them then the, the, the help that they need, because we definitely don't want them um, uh, stress. I always say that uh, we don't want them underwhelmed, right? I, I've never heard of anybody being underwhelmed, but the overwhelmed at this time in the year, it's, it's late uh, in, in May. We definitely want them to, to come back as educators. Uh, and we'll continue to meet with Bear County staff regarding wraparound services 24 7. Uh, Melissa Tejerina is great with, at the Bear Cares and has been able to, to get me to connect with uh, numbers to put on here. Because I look at it from the lens of a student. If I'm 11, if I'm 11 years old and it's 10 p.m. at night or it's 2 in the morning, who can I call for help? My counselor's not going to be available. Uh, and so we intentionally put those numbers out there to continuously to reach others. Um, and I'm, I'll be presenting at the National Conference for Reaching the Wounded Student. Uh, one thing we I did did identify is got, we got a lot of accolades thanks to Salute America, um, our A2A attendance. A lot of some campuses across the country may have just a certain campus. Uh, so we've been very fortunate that to have a superintendent that has backed this from the day one and has allowed and it's transformed our entire culture of our, of our district to where everyone uh, is the whole district is is embedded into this. So uh, as I go speak, I, I not only do I present, but at the same time, this is going to be your protocol. Uh, so everything from, you know, custodial staff, because, again, they need to understand that they're they're, a, they're an important piece to this. You see something, say something, go tell your 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 supervisor, your supervisor will get with the, the campus contact or contact your director uh, who will get a hold of me and then we'll, we'll make sure that that student gets, gets addressed. Because the bottom line is that we want to make sure that if a student's having a bad day uh, or something has come forward, we want to make sure before he gets goes back home, he's got to have an adult conversation, adult interaction before you don't want the student to be depressed down and then continue to have that compounded uh, when he gets at home. Yeah, that's that's so incredible. It's such a uh, great program that's expanding across the entire district. Um, you know, starting some campuses at a time, some departments at a time. So with everything John explained, we, you know, put that in a case study and then the video, and then we're kind of using that as a foundation for this five-step toolkit to help other districts do something similar, to help them put these you know, multiple components in place to create the whole system for trauma-informed care in their district. And if you want to take a screenshot of this real quick or um, write down that um, bit link, sorry, I'm going to add it into the chat so you can copy and paste it also. Um, so that should show up. Um, in the chat, so write that down and we'll come back to that one too. So that's that's where you can sign up and then this is what you can expect when you sign up for this this action pack or this kind of toolkit. Um, one is is starting the conversation. That's the first step and then 
creating this task force, developing a vision based on your, your district's needs. Um, there's ways, there's immediate actions and steps you can take to build this trauma-informed care system quickly. And then there's some more comprehensive actions that you can take. Um, and then going outside the school and raising awareness. So looking at this first step, um, starting the conversation, the idea is to reach out to some decision makers and leaders, maybe the superintendent, other campus representatives and change agents. And the idea with this toolkit and what we will provide are some model emails. We'll provide kind of the template for the language that you can use to send to them and you can send them the way it is. You're welcome to edit or modify. We kind of make it, um, you know, communication is a huge part of, of building the case. It's bringing in the research, um, connecting it to the solutions, and kind of raising support. So we, we want to create those model emails to do it for you. Um, similarly with these model talking points. So for phone calls, so you can kind of be prepared with these bite-sized talking points that are really digestible. Um, and then also we provide that case study and hero story for you to share with others as an example. You know, as, um, you can share through emails, through social media, kind of raise awareness, hey, this is what the school district did, we could do something similar. Um, the next step, the idea is to create this task force and develop the vision. So with different campus representatives and representatives from the various departments, like John mentioned, um, and then presenting to them and creating a vision for the system and how that could work in your district. So the idea with this step is that we will also provide similar model emails, template emails to help recruit, to help build that case, um, kind of mobilize people. We'll provide um, handouts on childhood trauma. We'll provide the PowerPoint presentation for you to present to this group. Um, we'll also provide um, additional guides on kind of how to help set up a focus group, um, prevent to the, present to the group, um, kind of how to regularly convene. Um, these guides will include issues like um, setting norms for the group, you know, respect, um, discuss, you know, everyone check your use of social media or cell phones while in the meeting, um, setting a schedule, um, and then starting that conversation for needs in your district and how a system can address them. And step three is looking at some of those um, immediate actions to take to start this system. So kind of building on John's example that they did here at East Central ISD is with that local resource guide. That's something that a, a task force can start right away. Um, it's compiling this resource guide, calling them, making sure they're there. And so we'll provide that template of a resource guide to give you ideas of examples of local organizations that can provide these services and resources. Um, also like the EC Cares did is this tracking protocol. So depending on the software that your school or district uses, you know, we'll kind of provide this template that John used and you could take it and do something similar um, in your software system. And then creating the chain of command, we'll provide that template, that example of what John uses of who that first responder, who sees a child in need and then they know who to go to. Um, and also raising district awareness. That's kind of something that can be done right away is, is get in, um, get on their schedule for in-service days, even if it's 10 or 15 minutes at a time, um, to start talking about the science behind trauma, the effects of trauma, and what you and the task force are thinking about and interested in working on. And we will provide um, a PowerPoint to help you get that going also. And then the fourth step is um, some of those more comprehensive actions that can take um, a little bit more time, a little bit more mobilization to get going. Um, such as um, alternative discipline, kind of modifying um, disciplinary actions in your district, um, including social and emotional learning in the curriculum and improving access to mental and behavioral health services, whether that's um, in your district itself or better connected to coordinated services in the community. So we will provide resources for this continuing education. Um, lots of examples of evidence-based programs out there for trauma-sensitive practices and social and emotional learning curriculum. So we'll kind of provide um, what's, what's already existing, what's out there, um, and what's working. And then that last step is to take it out of the school and raise community awareness. So um, taking this out external partners, this could be um, faith community, this could be um, parents, this can be other organizations, this can be elected elected officials. So 
Again, what we will provide to help you accomplish this step is the case study in Food Hero story we've done, these model template emails, as well as model social media messages. So for quick, easy sharing, just to maybe copy and paste that, um, that message to continue to build awareness. I mean, we'll also provide um, a PowerPoint so that you can have something already ready um, to take and share. And so these are kind of all the five steps to um, get this going in your district. And the idea is, um, is to maintain contact. We're gonna be here the whole time to provide technical assistance. I'm working with our nationwide partners um, already in these, working in these programs and kind of building this research um, as well as with John Hernandez, who's on the ground doing this right now. And so we'll have this continued conversation and providing technical assistance. And then hopefully as you get going and make progress um, in building this system in your district, you'll update us and let us know, and we can promote it on our website and to our nationwide network. Um, and there will even be Salute America t-shirts um, in the mix as well, once you get your system up and going. Um, and just um, as John touched on this um, compassion, fatigue, and burnout, we kind of want to end with this, you know, quote from Mother Teresa is never worry about numbers, help one person at a time, and always start with the person nearest you. And that's kind of this overall idea with changing the culture in schools is it's not something new that you have to budget for. It's not something new that teachers do. It's this idea of trauma sensitive Trauma sensitivity should be the soul and, and the blood of a school. Um, so I want to open it up to thoughts um, or questions. Um, this is the idea of this toolkit is it's a, it's a living document. It's a growing document. We'll continue expanding on. And as schools and districts across the country are beginning to do this more, we'll learn from them and do more case studies and learn more kind of best practices um, to build on these five steps. Um, maybe dig in a little deeper, a little more comprehensive. Um, so we'll start with um, the question from from Olga Rodriguez: Is how the faith community, how can the faith community get involved? And I, I mean, the timing's perfect. Is is with what John's been working on in the school. Is just this past week he already um, reached out to get the faith community involved. So I'm going to let John answer this one. All right. So we just uh, finished up our, our last EC CARES meeting for the year, and we have a transition meeting with our team. But I felt that it was important for to get the one of the last pillars of, of ours, a community base, is how do you improve this in your community? So I went to most of the churches and called a lot of the churches in, in the district uh, to get them to come in. And so they were represented there at our meeting. Um, and so I, I think a big perception is, and, and talking to some of the church faith based is like schools don't want us in there, um, but you're more than welcome. And so you got definitely want to do a welcoming piece to where uh, you make them feel at home. Um, and, but we're going to have a follow up meeting in June and we'll continue to build on that. And so it looks like it'll kind of mirror uh, what we're doing with EC cares, but because at the same time is some of the, the needs that we have, the faith based have the same needs, right? So they have high divorce rate as well. And so we're going to partner up together. Um, and it was great to have voices from different uh, denominations because it allows everyone to, again, it, you, it's a safe environment to where no one, everyone's on the same level. And so, and we'll continue to bring those to, to meet the needs of our students uh, moving forward. Yeah, that, so I, I want to add on to that too, is um, John kind of had mentioned he was interested in doing this, and I guess I didn't realize he was going to do it so soon is when I asked, so how did you reach out to them? He he just called them or he just would show up. He would literally drive there and just show up. Um, and that's, you know, such an important outreach um, tactic. And with the toolkit, what what we would have loved to help do too and what we would love to help anyone interested to do is, is help create maybe some of those emails to open that conversation or some talking points so that you feel empowered and prepared to just make that phone call and to just show up. Um, yeah, that's really cool that they did that and um, had a lot of a lot of turnout at their EC Cares committee meeting. Um, let's see. Next question. Oh, so a question oh. about the polling was, I guess, at the DAP was this um, seemingly casual conversations with students or was the polling um, an anonymous? survey listing the trauma traumatic events. Yeah, so that was a, a 
conversation, just kind of walking away from the bus and how's it going, uh, your grades, and then, and then the question will become, have you ever gone through any event, traumatic event in your life? And, and so basically it was very informal, uh, but I just took a tally sheet my own self. And, and so then I knew immediately as to where some kids were struggling in some areas and I immediately was able to connect with, okay, so this young man's got this on his plate, this one, you know, it's got this. And then so I would ask, like, well, I'm sorry that you lost your, your father, but what, what day did you say he, he passed away? Well, it was December 12th. Well, then I knew I can go into December 12th and I already put him on the system. And so before that week, I was able to, hey, in the event that I know it's a, it's a tough week for you, um, just know that I'm here. And that was that's all we did is, is that we didn't force any counseling on, on these students. It was our doors open. Uh, you come seek us. But I think the, the biggest thing was that you saw a smile that, Somebody actually uh, listened that, you know, my father passed away six years ago. And, and so we acknowledged it and, and you know, we moved forward. Uh, but I told him it doesn't excuse the behavior. You know, you still maintain your high expectations. That doesn't change. Um, so that's kind of what we did. And we do that with all students now. Every time when they get sent to alternative school, we have those conversations. Um, so the next question um, is maybe kind of the time frame, if you want to walk through. So when it all started. So. When you came back from that um, uh, June, uh, dropout prevention and started the government right. task force. So June 2016, uh, met with the superintendent. Um, and August of 2016 was the first time we had our EC CARES meeting. And there, there, there were some in the team, they were a little nervous because again, you don't know, you have to share, share your vision from the get go. And, and so I shared our attendance data. And you can do the same thing with referrals if you're trying to, to attract uh, decrease in the referrals, whatever the case might be. But we, we chose attendance, I was over attendance. Uh, for the entire district. Um, and so from August till December, we started meeting, I'd say September, I apologize, September to December, started meeting with those families individually uh, as to, I started tallying up different reasons that were beyond their control. I just didn't feel right as a taxpayer. Uh, I lived in the district uh, pursuing them to, to court, to see a judge where I felt like in our district, we can stop, put a yield sign or a stop sign and say, we're not gonna move forward uh, with this. We're gonna get you the help that you need. Um, and so during that process throughout the year, I started going to different groups. So I went to transportation, followed that up with nutrition, uh, all the nurses in the district, um, all the custodial staff in the district, all the technology staff in the district. It just kept going on and on because a lot were like, Hey, we want you to come present the, the training that you had. We want you to come present. So it was, some were seeking it. And then some, I, said, I didn't force myself on any campus. Uh, campuses signed up as well uh, because again they know the pulse of their campus they're like um, we want you to come by and, and so there was another activity that had tied me in with it uh, we had a middle school that did a, a basically they drove a, around the district uh, to see that way the teachers the new teachers can see where the kids live in the district where their, their backgrounds where they're coming from uh, and then we tied that up with the, with the meeting uh, as well and so I'd say be a year and a half has been a time frame that I just now involved the community, the faith base to come in. And so that was one of the last pieces uh, in looking at the, the, the entire from point A to B uh, or Z per se is, is probably about a year and a half. But again, we have a tremendous committee. We got tremendous directors in our district that have allowed us to come in uh, and they, they, they call our office about, Hey, uh, we, one of my workers at this campus is struggling with this and, and so the directors have been very influential, um, principals as well, got great leadership. Uh, and so it, that's kind of spread pretty quick and it transformed. Um, um, I kind of have to follow up, I guess, with the time frame. So it started August 2016 at the task force. When did you come out the first? Um, the resource first, guide, I yeah. gave that out. Um, it was actually in August, because I started the resource guide in July of that year. And so in August, I gave that out, my first copy to our focus group, but it was only about three quarters. Uh, and now it's page to page. And again, when you talk to community, it was all, we want something simple, something uh, I can take in my hand uh, because there's booklets and there's tons of information, but we basically corralled all those resources into, into one page, made it real simple. Um, and then on the backside, it's got all the signs, the signs that if they're going through any of those, uh, and that's kind of what exposed some of the, the other leaders, uh, employees in our organization, like, hey, I'm going through this myself. 
is it okay if I can share this with my neighbor because she's going through divorce? No, without a doubt. So that's for anyone in, in our district and in San Antonio that can use these resources uh, because it's, it, they don't ask where you're coming from. Uh, they want to just help based on my questions and creating that resource guide. Yeah. And then I guess another follow-up with that one after the resource guide is when um, did the AC Care staff go through that kind of first online training certificate to the yeah, hope May. students? May, May of, of last year, of 2017. So last year we were fortunate that we were able to send uh, 10 of our, our team to uh, the Reaching the Wounded Student Conference in Orlando. Uh, however, others that weren't fortunate to go, that they were put on that online course. Um, and so to this day, anyone that wants to take those online classes can definitely do so. They just contact me or, or Meredith Rokas, our federal programs director, and then we make that happen. Excuse me. Cool. What is that? So we will, um, we definitely be sharing this presentation and this um, this PowerPoint is, is very similar to um, the PowerPoints that will be included in the toolkit. Um, so please definitely sign up for that. Um, thank you for the um, positive comments to you. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I might be confused about one of the questions, what um, student relationship management does the team use that he demonstrated with his child? So I don't know what child, we were talking about it, that came through at 1227. 1227? Um, what? I don't know if that would have been maybe the one where he had two parents incarcerated maybe? Yeah, so, I'm, any campus calls me uh, when I'm over attendance or even the case manager. Um, and so when they contact me and they, they just want to know, you know, the kids missed 32 days. Like, what, let's, let's get to the bottom of this. And then so when you start calling parents or you start calling, whether it's a grandparent, um, then you just visit with the student. You, I, I, I bring them in and say, what's going on. And again, it's not the very first thing we talk about, but we, we talk about grades, we talk about different items. And sometimes you talk them at the cafeteria, um, and, but it's, it's in with their counselor. So the counselor knows the student, because again, I'm a stranger on their campus, uh, per se. Um, and so we just, the counselor will inform me of, oh, this is what's going on. And so we're able to, to connect with. Um, so, but it's a lot of trust. It's a lot of trust. Uh, definitely uh, don't want to be punitive by any means but we take a lot of pride in building student relationships. Um, well, I guess was, there was a question about the software um, used for the Red Alert, I think. Um, in Texas, it's... ITEC. Okay. It's, IT, it's through our region's uh, 20 service center. Uh, Texas has 20 service centers. But in talking to other districts that don't use ITEX, for example, they were able to what what system in your in your in your own school district can you use that you can basically tag a student. Um, so in our end here in, in Region 20, a lot of us use that Region 20 to where it, it when you put that information, it, if I don't have anything on that child, it'll say just a grayscale box. That's all it is. But the moment I put something in there, that's just special alert. That's what it does. So. Any anyone in the system, then when they go to the screen to check the schedule of that student, it'll see special alert, and you click on that, and it'll tell you the information that someone wrote in there, whether hey Billy can't be next to John, uh, those. So it allows that counselor not to put classes with them two together. That's what that's what the same system that was already, we were already using prior to other uh, scenarios. We we've just kind of used that to, to use our as our, as our guiding point. Yeah. Um. Um, and then I do think um, for the uh, outstanding. Thank you. <laughs> the one thing I will acknowledge is that uh, a lot of these before you just send kids a core truancy, it was just that one student. But it's obvious that it became a. It's not a a a truancy problem. It's a problem of, at home that's causing the truancy. So you had a student at third grade, brother in fifth grade, kid at the high school, we had to get the family the services that they need because it's not just that one kid that they're struggling with at that one elementary, but I've met with all the campuses and told them, hey, listen, we got to get the families as to what they need because it's something definitely going on at home that's out of their control and it's affecting all the students. Um, so 
like Dr. Perry says, if you're not taking care of the safe, nurturing environment at home, it's not going to happen at, at, at school. Um, so we do our best to partner with families uh, to get them to, to understand. But again, it is a, a system to where we do a family system to try to get the family the resources they need. But at the same time, get them to understand one of the hot topics right now is that we got some that uh, immigration is a big part. So the mother doesn't have papers. The kids do have papers. They go to school, but they're struggling. But I'm having to go there and they don't trust the system because they think I'm going to deport the, the, the kids. And so I'm having to to tell the parent, like, I'm just not what I'm here for. Yes, I'm doing a home visit. I went to school, but I'm not with the government. I am here to ensure your student success and, and that it, it'll be okay. But at the same time, understanding that they're going through a traumatic event at home because of the circumstances. And so, again, meet them where they're at, uh, eliminate a barrier, but ultimately communicate the importance of if you're missing school at an early age, it affects the reading levels. Reading levels affect academic performance. Uh, to where the family understands. And again, it's building that trust with the family and the student. Yeah. So I, I think that might be it for questions. Um, if this is the bit link again to sign up for the toolkit. Um, and then we'll send you an email and hopefully just kind of open the conversation there. And as you as you are inventing this system for your district, you know, hopefully with collaboration in mind is, you know, we want to be here to help with um, steps you need along the way, examples, resources, um, model emails, template presentations. Um, so you can just take it and go and you're not having to recreate the wheel or recreate any of this from scratch. Um, so thank you everyone so much for attending today. Um, feel free to reach out to us through various social media channels um, and sign up for this toolkit. Thank you. All right, have a good day.